Good morning, everybody. So this is our robot, Stevie. Uh, I thought I'd point to the elephant in the room. Um, this is something that we've built in our, in our research group in Trinity. Um, in recent years, we've... I'm going to talk a bit about the robots uh, later on. Um, it's, it's something that I guess it seems a bit novel and, and gimmicky, but there's very serious reasons why we, why we do this research. Uh, and I want to begin with those. So uh, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but we spend about 17% of our GDP each year on healthcare. Um, that equates to just over 20 billion, um, which when you figure it out per, per person, and by the way, I, I know this is a data science uh, conference, so I want to try to use as much data as I can uh, in, the t in the talk. So it works out at about 4,700 per person, which is the equivalent of a reasonably priced secondhand um, family vehicle uh, per person in Ireland each year. So this is very, very expensive, as you, as you know. Um, okay, so that's one thing. Now let's look at some factors that we need to consider uh, as to how, you know, why is it just so big? Well, we know that uh, hospital beds themselves, they, they're occupied by mostly older people. Uh, half the beds, just over half the beds are, are, are from people over the age of 65. Uh, we also know that older people, they tend to, to you know, live, live alone uh, as they get older, so one in three lives alone, uh, which has problems because if you live by yourself, you're more likely to be lonely and social, socially isolated, which has very serious consequences that people don't fully realize. Um, being lonely increases mortality by about 26%. Uh, and not just that, but you know, as you get older, uh, you, your, your sense of proprioception and mobility start to decrease, so you become more likely to fall. Um, and if you live by yourself and you're more likely to fall, when they, those falls happen, the consequences tend to be a lot worse. And of course, at that age, your body recovers slower, so not only are you spending longer in hospital, but the likelihood of you being able to uh, reclaim the, your former independence decreases. We also know that uh, you know, we start to see changes in how we're getting sick. Um, illnesses that would have killed us in the past are no longer killing us. And what that means is, is that you know, cognitive impairments like dementia are now starting to become, to become uh, you know, big killers. You know, we know from the statistics that you know, people are, growing, are getting the, uh, dementia at alarming rates. Um, and one of the things to note about dementia is that it's not treated the same way we treat you know, our cancers or, or breaking a leg. We can't just give a once-off treatment and hope that, it, hope that it works. It requires you know, ongoing uh, support and it gets worse progressively over time. So this means we need to have lots of people providing care. In the US alone, um, there's 18 million direct care workers, which is, if ever, you know, to put it in, in, in relative terms, that's if every man, woman in Ireland, uh, nearly four times over, was to be, to be in the profession. And a lot of these jobs, they're very low paying, around 10 to $12 an hour on average uh, for, for direct care workers. So why don't we you know, do it informally? So why do we need to pay people to do this? Surely our civic and ethical responsibility is to you know, look after our families themselves. Well, we do that. Uh, we know that one of five adults are, are caregivers of some type. Uh, we know that the average age of these adults is, tends to be 63, uh, which is problematic because of that 63 group, many of them are themselves sick. One in three of, that, of, the, of those people are, are, are themselves have some kind of issues. And this is a problem that's going to spiral. Um, we know that there's going to be three times the number of people over 80 by 2050, which is fast approaching. And we, there's, you know, it's, this is not being balanced out by young people. So we know, and we can see from the statistics, that the, the, the image here shows, the infographic shows, that in the past we used to have a lot more younger people for every older person. Now uh, we're starting to, to see that change. So this is alarming. Uh, and not many people are, are, are aware of these statistics. And while we talk about it, we don't do much about it. Um, so having looked at it, you know, my conclusion and the conclusions of our team is that we need robots, and we need them quite badly. I guess the, the robotics revolution, or evolution, I, I would say is happening. Um, so we can see some examples, kind of notable examples. One area where we see t technology moving and becoming more robotic is in mobility. Um, so, you know, the crutches or the walkers, we're starting to see them being phased out, but wearable technology uh, that's able to, to, to provide that power themselves. Um, it's not just the, the older people themselves, it's also their carers. So, you know, traditionally we, quite, we need sort of um, undignified, big lumbering machines to help carry people. This sort of technology has been extended uh, and is being extended for, for care workers themselves. It's, I guess, still quite experimental, as this robot suggests. Uh, I'm not sure how happy I would be personally to, to, to have this thing carry me, um, but I suppose 
it's, 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 it's a work in progress. We're seeing it in surgery. Um, so now, you know, you can, you, the, the, the surgery sessions you might have seen on ER or any of those kind of uh, house or any of those shows where you have, you know, multiple doctors and nurses clamoring together in a, in a room, um, we're starting to see machines uh, able to not only reduce the number of people that can do surgeries, but imp- significantly improve uh, the, 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 the actual performance, reduce the time, and possibly even be able to, to permit remote surgeries where you don't actually have a patient and a doctor co-located. An area that seems, on first impression, uh, a little bit more trivial is our so, what are called socially assistive robots. Why build technology like this, and how does it have applications in healthcare? What's, you know, it's funny because uh, you and I, when we look at these machines, we think they're entertainment. Um, the reality is that to many people, they're more than that. And I guess the reason why they're more than that, having, having spent a lot of time over the last couple of years, you know, not just building and being involved in the technology, but actually spending time with and living alongside older people, um, I've noticed that there's very few things that, in their lives that on a regular basis keep them happy and keep them entertained. And if there's no joy in your life, then what's the point? Um, not just that, if, if, you know, if, you're, if, you're not, if you don't have things to keep you entertained and you don't have the potential to, to, to socially interact, because quite often that's, that's the case, as people get older they become socially isolated, there's also no sense of responsibility. So people don't work anymore, they rarely ask their opinion on things. So that doesn't feel good. Um, and what happens is that quite often, you know, people just, you know, they're, they're, they're upset, they're anxious, they're worried, and they don't really see the point anymore. And if you're not motivated, you know, you're, you're not going to be healthy, you're not going to eat well, you're not going to take your medication when you want, you're not going to exercise. These are all factors uh, that, that, that kick in. And what we've seen is that robots like these, um, robots that don't perform any tangible tasks, but improve the quality of life of, of people, they actually do have indirect benefits, significant ones in fact. Um, what you see here is a, a ceremony in Japan where there's a Buddhist priest who's doing a burial ceremony for robot dogs. Which sounds silly, but you know, when you think of, of, of pets and your home, like, you know, we have burials for, for, for actual animals. Um, when you get to a certain point, maybe you can't keep pets anymore. It's not, you know, you're not, they're not going to last very long, but you know, we can still develop technology that serves the same purpose. And this is an, an interesting area, I, I think, to explore. Um, and this is one that I think we have, as a, as a, as a, as a research group, identified. It's, it's, you know, we, we think that we can develop technology that can empower people, as we've mentioned. As, as engineers, of course, that's what we're going to do. But in doing so, does it make sense to build these things as clinical machines? Or does it make sense to build these things as things that have you know, a latent sense of, of animacy and something that provides not just the, the, the functional utility, but the experiential and the hedonic one too. So the, our goals as a, as a research group at the moment have been to do three things. One, to develop technology that can empower staff. If staff or professional care workers don't buy into this, then it fundamentally will not work. Uh, I believe that fundamentally. Second thing we want to do is try to address things that traditional technology can't. Things like social isolation, loneliness, they're the starting points. Cog- you know, cognitive impairment, I-, I think, comes a little bit later. And finally, we think that if these robots can be bought, bought into, if they can coexist alongside uh, these users, then we can collect information and data over time that through machine learning and data science uh, will be able to give new insights into, into you know, the progression of illness, uh, but also in terms of the quality of life, which too is a, is a predictor. So what we've built, uh, what our creation is, 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 is this robot here uh, that we call Stevie. This is the second version of the platform. Uh, it builds on about 10 years of research in, in, in broader robotics, and what it tries to do uh, is to coexist alongside as, as, as older people. Um, it has sensors on it, quite a wide range, so you can see we've got five cameras that can visually perceive what's, what's in the surroundings. Uh, we've got a 3D depth sensor, which effectively is able to correlate pixels in, a, in, a, in an image with the distance that those pixels is relative to the robot. Uh, we also have two laser sensors, which again is, provides extra redundancy so the robot doesn't crash into things. Um, you know, we have microphones, of course, that enable dialogue to, to be had between the robot and, and, and the users. Uh, this robot exists in a state of what's called mixed autonomy, so some of the tasks that the robot can do, it does it itself, uh, while other things are, are remote controlled by a human operator. This is very, very useful because you know, there's many occasions, especially in retirement communities, where the, the facilities are understaffed and management are you know, not, for whatever reason, it's not possible for them to be present. That could be 4 a.m. on a Sunday, could be Christmas, 
you know, it, it needs, needs must. And at the moment, the response time and the decision-making process in these places is hugely offset by the fact that quite often the decision-makers aren't positioned at the right times to make these decisions. There's other occasions where you don't want autonomy, um, such as when, you know, you want to, to, like, the case we see a lot in the US is where um, retired people tend to live in a, a different place to where their kids uh, are working. So that means the kids don't often see their parents. And while they might have phone conversations, if someone's hearing's not very good, that means they don't hear the phone. It also means they struggle to, to, uh, to be able to use the, the technology. So by being able to use the robots to facilitate video calling or you know, teleconferencing, um, we've seen some uh, very interesting things emerge. I'll show you a short video uh, now, which kind of outlays some of our experiences. Uh... Stevie, maybe on your next visit to Knollwood, you could join us at our karaoke on a Thursday night. I would love to. They were treating Stevie not as this new piece of technology. They were humanizing him. It really showed how open the Knollwood residents are to not only accepting Stevie and the team as members of the Knollwood family, just how excited they are to have this new innovation here at Knollwood and here helping them, helping their peers, and it was really warm. Yes, I would love that. Oh, yes, I would love that. Good evening, everyone. It is great to meet you all. Thank you for having me tonight. I am very excited to play bingo with you all. G58, G58. This is a piece of everybody in Stevie. The people behind Stevie are yeah, an incredibly talented group of people that have you know, sacrificed a huge amount and you know, through their dedication and hard work over um, and you know, like any you know, piece of music or art reflects the artist behind it, that's, that's also true in the robots. A lot of engineers are supposed to come out with technology and, and they create a solution and then they go off looking for a problem to solve, you know, whereas uh, this team have, you know, realised there's a problem. They've all been affected in some way by the effects of ageing and so on. Um, and so they know what the problems are and they're motivated to discover um, and build solutions to solve those problems. Almost always we look to see what the best practices are out there. By partnering with research organizations that are incorporating these best practices, we can have other organizations looking to say, what is NOLA doing? We're here to serve our residents in the best possible way. But in so doing, we're developing best practices that can really give back to our field. It's very awesome to be at the ground level watching this unfold and be able to be a helping hand in this innovation that's going to potentially help our community, but the senior living community as a whole. It's very exciting. It's easy to get distracted by a robot like Steve. What we're trying to achieve here is to try and improve the quality of care that, that residents have, and Stevie is just a part of that picture. Technology like Stevie, some of the paratherapists and nurses and the like, to be able to develop specific bespoke applications. Uh, we can disseminate it so that the knowledge that gets put to the test here can be spread further afield. So that was a, 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 quite a short video just giving a broad overview of our uh, recent pilots that we've been doing in the US with Stevie. Um, these pilots are somewhat unique in the field because really no one has ever deployed a robot quite like Stevie uh, for as long or as involved as, as we have. These have been programs that we've deployed within existing uh, care procedures in, in, in retirement communities. It's not research experiments, but actual, uh, actually it's part of a wellness activities program that were there. So in total, since February last year, we've had the robot on the ground doing these things for uh, just over two months. Uh, and on average, it's three hours per day. So it's not spread out every, you know, once or twice a week uh, as, a, as somewhat of a novelty. This is something that has become part of their everyday life. Um, I want to finish the talk by just giving some insights, I suppose, uh, that we've picked up over, over the last couple of months since we've started these tests. Uh, things that I guess have surprised us um, and I thought would be interesting to, to share with you all. Um, the first... When we build a robot like Stevie, our worry is, is, was, it was initially, is this, you know, what happens if it doesn't work, or you know, please work. Make sure, like, you know, we spent all this time trying to make this thing work, and for the most part, it, it did work. Uh, it required a lot of supervision, so there was, you know, for the first couple of weeks, there was you know, usually an engineer on site, and if something went wrong, we would be very nervous to, to, to inter, you know, intervene straight away and fix the problem as soon as possible. Um, but it was only when stuff started to fail that we realized 
it, it, you know, it was only when we started to fail when things went wrong and, and we couldn't do anything about it uh, that we started to get real insights as to its capability of being accepted. Uh, with phones, with cars, anything else. If you have a car and it breaks down on the way to work, what happens? You, know, you get pretty annoyed at your car. Similarly with your phone. How long will it take your phone breaking repeatedly before you get a new phone? Probably not very long. And what we've seen is with our robot, the fact that it wasn't perfect humanized it in a very strange way. Uh, the, one of the things we, we, we do or we did was um, we had the robot play bingo. This was a task that staff uh, you know, would have done otherwise. And when staff are, play, are, are doing bingo, they're at the front of the room and they have to read numbers out, which is pretty mundane and repetitive. And it means they can't actually give attention to the robot. Bingo in this place is very competitive, just to give a small bit of background. Um, so if we decided to, 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 and we did, we decided to have Stevie do bingo one of the days, and it worked fine for the first 30 minutes, and then there was an issue with the, with the sound card uh, on, the, on the robot, and for some reason the robot actually didn't articulate the, 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 the bingo numbers. And we thought it was going to erupt in carnage, because you know, any, small modifi- any small issue, would, they'd be fighting amongst the, the, the people there. Uh, And what actually happened was quite different. Um, People were actually giving encouragement to the robot. They were saying, come on, Stevie. Uh, We managed to get the the, the thing back up working intermittently. Um, But it would break down periodically. Probably broke down eight or nine times over the course of 40 minutes. And at the end of it, we thought that people would would have hated the session. We give them, you know, um, feedback surveys. And we thought they were going to hammer us. And it turned out they didn't. And this has happened multiple times since then. And I guess the point we have is, we, the point I wanted to make is that when we're testing this type of technology, perhaps we shouldn't be asking you know, questions like, you know, will it work? We should be asking what will happen if it doesn't work? Um, because I think error tolerance is, is, is very, or failure tolerance is, is a big thing. The second thing uh, is that when we develop machine learning systems and AI systems, we tend to think of uh, you know, the data sets that we're going to collect, and we like to have tidy data sets, well-labeled data sets. We've learned two things about this. First, they de- tend not to work very well with older people because, for the most part, data sets are trained on younger people. Um, so not often, you know, we, we, we tend to have to be able to collect our, our data actually in the field itself. Uh, but the second thing is that we often don't know what data we need to collect. We don't know exactly how the robot should behave because, you know, this is the first time that anyone's done these tests with robots. Um, so what that's kind of forced us to do, or led us to do, is to take a little bit of a different approach towards building robots. We don't focus initially on building autonomous robots. That takes huge amounts of time and resources to build these algorithms, to deploy these algorithms. Instead, what we do uh, is we start out uh, by remote controlling the robot. Um, so we try as much as possible, at least in the early stages, for the robot to be largely a teleoperated robot, where we have human operators who are doing it. These human operators are our top machine learning people. They're our top AI people. We get our best AI machine learning people, and we put them in retirement communities, remote controlling robots for weeks. And what happens then is they know the parameters for success. They know what the data needs to look like. They know that when they're, when they're building their models, uh, if this may work or not. They've developed that sense of intuition that you're never going to be able to teach in a university. And this build leads me on to my final point. Not everything needs to be autonomous. We think of this technology, we assume, somehow we assume this robot has to be sentient. It doesn't. There are many applications where it, 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 you know, having it remote controlled is, is, is absolutely just fine. Uh, I'll, I'll mention two. Well, the one on the right is kind of self-explanatory. This is where um, the robot's simply just a vehicle to make existing technology more accessible. We've seen that with, with video calls. But secondly, we've, uh, one of the things we had the pleasure of being involved with, the guy, the guy here on the left is a guy called Phil. And Phil is a... Uh, he's a, he's a retire, retired serviceman, and he uh, gets great pleasure out of singing. He says singing is uh, it's, it's, um, it, it's food for the soul. That's what he calls it. And uh, each each month he runs a, kind of what he, what he calls a karaoke, but it's really a group singing along session where he has this machine. Um, it, it has a uh, they can play a bunch of karaoke songs, and they have a screen that that sing that the music gets displayed. And what we did is we basically just brought the robot along. We didn't change his session. It was exactly as it was. But instead, we had a, a robot that could dance and, and, and interact. And we had an operator just pu- pu- putting out text commands. And for some reason, what happened when we deployed it was that people were far more likely to, to sing out loud because they felt they, were, they had an agent, they had some kind of uh, focal point for, to, to direct attention. And the robot, again, under perfect remote control, this, doesn't, this would not need to be autonomous, uh, was able to actually solicit people singing in a much more effective way than a person otherwise would have. So we're learning a lot of very interesting things uh, about how this technology can complement 
um, existing care staff and support older people. And you know, by having robots like Stevie help Phil, what we're doing is, is that you know, we're giving him a tool to, 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 to run these sessions. Um, and as a result, our, our adoption and the, this sense of novelty that's so often synonymous with robots starts to fade. We have um, some more pilots coming up. So we, we tested it in the US, which is in one setting. We're pretty confident that what we've learned there will, 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 um, will, will translate, but we're going to pr- hopefully show that in a few weeks. We're going to England, to the Cornwall region, to, to do a similar pilot this time with people with dementia. Uh, and we hope that and we're also, I suppose, working on our next version of the prototype or the next version of the, roto- the, the, the robot that we hope will leave the lab for, forever uh, and actually become a permanent deployment. And we hope to make that happen in some stage around the middle of 2020. If you're interested in keeping uh, track of our progress, the, t- the robot's Twitter is, is up there. And no prize for t- guessing, it doesn't autonomously tweet. We, we tweet ourselves. Thanks. Thank you very much, Connor. That was... Uh really very interesting. Um, I suppose just a quick question for you. Um, I suppose we saw there that we had, you know, the, 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 almost the ro- robotized or robotic dogs, you know, almost replacing um, those household pets. And I suppose we always would have thought of, of, you know, dogs being man's best friend. And one of the kind of wonderful things that you anecdotally hear about dogs, is especially dogs who, you know, care dogs looking after sick owners, um, is that they can sense when something might be about to happen. You know, say a seizure's coming on, the dog might react in a certain way or, you know, hold the, 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 the owner in a certain way. Um, has that been something that you've looked at, I suppose, in terms of integrating maybe bioinformatic sensors to understand what might happen next, or even if it's reacting to what has happened? So let's say we say with older people, big risk is falls. So identifying the patient is falling and then, let's say, kicking off a chain of events. Yeah, I, I, like, I, I think personally distributed intelligence is going to be a real game changer in long-term living communities. Um, when we think of, like, just to, as a point of uh, information, the, the retirement community where we do the testing, they have, I think, 150 staff. Okay. Um, so those people, like, they have the responsibility now in, in, to do their, in doing their jobs, which you know, might be helping people with you know, activities of daily living, physiotherapy, getting them food, cooking, cleaning, these kind of things. But additionally, there's a kind of a responsibility there to keep an eye out for things that go wrong. Um, and many things do go wrong. The challenges are one of the huge challenges to be able to, like, how do you handle all that information and that data? Like, what, what one person sees in the morning doesn't get communicated to the person who takes over the, the next shift. It doesn't, sure. not, at least not easily. It's also a, an industry that has huge turnover. About, you know, 45% of, of you know, turnover is, is standard enough. The opportunity with distributed intelligence is that if we can have lots of smart things, or like, we, well, not re- when we, say, we call them smart things anecdotally, but really they're dumb, they're sensors that can, that can measure things. What happens over time is we can aggregate that information, and this sort of big data effect can track behaviors. It can track you know, if someone's sleeping too much, if someone's wandering at nighttime, if someone's behavior is not quite right, and it can inform the, the human caregiver. With the, the benefit of a robot is that it's, it's more than just a passive sensor. So with, a, with sensors in the room, you can get that information, but really if you want to, to probe and you want to test something out, you're, you're limited. Uh, and I think the potential to be able to harness all of that together is, 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 is something that I think will enable um, a paradigm shift in the, the efficiency and effectiveness of you know, um, care supports in the home and in community settings. Excellent. Very interesting. Well, as I'm sure you can all agree, um, that was a fantastic um, introduction to Stevie the Robot um, and the work that he can do. Um, So if you put your hands together, please, for Dr. Connor McGinn.